Well, good evening, Bannister Road Baptist Church family. Uh, get your Bibles, and we're going to be going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we are studying and looking over the spiritual, spiritual gifts in particular uh, that the Apostle Paul teaches to the Church of Corinth and also to us. Uh, we've had the luxury of having some very decent weather these last few Sundays, and that has permitted us to meet on the parking lot on those Sundays. Uh, this weekend is going to be a little bit difficult to call, so we probably will not be able to say yeah or nay to service this week until later on in the week. So please be sure you check your emails um, as late as uh, Friday or Saturday. We'll try to get that out. But it looks like the weather is going to be a little bit more inclement weather, a little bit more colder, and so that might preclude us being able to get together on the parking lot service. But if that happens, we will still be available on the website or the YouTube that you can view the sermon uh, that will be preached uh, for this weekend, so you can still avail yourself of that. I've enjoyed these services that we can get together, and we're going to continue to try to have them again as we can and when we can. Thank God for all of the workers who worked diligently to help us uh, be able to have a medium to do this. Thank God for technology because we can... We're, we're, we have this pandemic that's keeping us away, but we have mediums that allows us to come together the best we can. It's not ideal, not what we desire, but it is what we can do until the Lord says differently. Um, want to also uh, get you to remember uh, that we have some that are sick and shut in in our church, and we want to remember them in prayer. Still praying for Brother Gladney's family. Services, I understand, are going to be this Saturday. Uh, you can uh, uh, send some expressions to him. That email or that address will go out to send them to his wife, Eloise. And uh, we're praying, thankful that our brother is no longer suffering. He's home with the Lord, but he's a good brother, good friend. And we will miss him, but we will see him again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to once again speak to your people out of your sacred book, this blessed book. It still excites our soul. We still enjoy so much learning from it. And Father, we want you to teach us by your spirit. Teach me that I might teach the folks uh, the word of God and teach it accurately. We pray your blessings on those who are suffering and hurting today. We also pray for Brother Gladney's uh, family, uh, Sister Andrina's uh, family, as they are also suffering the loss of a loved one. We do pray, God, that you'll bring comfort to all who are experiencing bereavement and grief at this time to the Johnson family as well, uh, Scotty Jerlin, who's also had some loss in theirs. And we pray, Lord, that they are consoled and find comfort in what the Word of God teaches about the God of all comfort. Uh, Lord, help us today or this evening to give your word accurately, we pray, as we talk about spiritual matters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very quick, very, very quick review. Uh, we've been teaching about spiritual gifts because the Apostle Paul said he didn't want us to be ignorant. And so it's right for us to approach this subject to try to gain knowledge and understanding so we can not only know what to believe but what to practice and what to teach others. He also wanted us to wear that, be aware that there's God and how God would guide us. There's also Satan and Satan, his, his counterfeits, who will try to move us in another direction even on spiritual matters. Some had come into the church and under the guise of being in the spirit had said Jesus was accursed. And certainly that could not have been of God and it was a different spirit. It was a spirit of Antichrist. So there are spirits that need to be discerned as we talk about spiritual matters. And then also the Lord, he wanted us to know that in the ministry of the spirit, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit work in conjunction. They work in unison one with another. The Father is not going to lead one way and Jesus lead another way and the Holy Spirit lead another way. That is, in fact, in the Godhead, there's perfect harmony and unity. So there's no conflict. You're not going to find God saying something in his word and the Holy Spirit uh, guiding people differently because that would be impossible. That's not how God operates. And then the other thing is the Holy Spirit has been assigned the, this particular ministry of assimilating and giving out and guiding people in spiritual matters. Jesus' function was to come, die, and be the redemptive price, the Lamb of God. 
his work was to be the one who would give his life, shed his blood, go up to glory. But in his going, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is now coming to the world to bear witness to who Jesus is, to bring conviction about sin. But he also is here to inhabit the church, to, to dwell within the believer and also inhabit the body of Christ, which is his church. And so we're looking uh, for those who have, who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, John 7, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. As the, Spirit of, uh, and, uh, as the Spirit have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe should receive. People who believe in Jesus receive. Which he's talking about the Holy Spirit. During the time that Christ was on the earth, the Holy Spirit was not given because the remainder of the verse says because Jesus was not yet glorified. He is today. And in his glorification at the right hand of the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit into the world who now has come in to dwell in believers and also to serve, uh, to, to minister to the church corporately and what he wants them to have, the gifts, how he wants them to serve. And so we're now looking at this part in 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul is going to take the human body and the Lord is going to allow him to use this as an illustration of how the human body is designed to function with all of its parts, with all of its diversity, in such a way as one that God gets the glory. Now, I think it's um, John Phillips wrote this. He said, the human body bears all the marks of a sovereign design. It is the work of an omniscient genius and of an omnipotent power. Each member is not only complex beyond all thought, but perfectly suited for the part it has to play in relation to every other part. The psalmist put it this way, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, the psalmist said, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul right knoweth. Psalms 139 verses 13 through 15. The writer said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But this is also true. The marvelous unity of the human body designed by God is also true of God's spiritual body. It is a mysterious and a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is going to take the human body and try to draw some contrasts or analogies to that which should be true of also of the spiritual body. But also before we start, because we have a spiritual, a spiritual body, the body of Christ, and because the Holy Spirit inhabits that body, and because he will equip and give people certain gifts, the possession of spiritual gifts in the church is not an equation to spirituality. This point must be noted early. For example, in 1 Corinthians 1 through 11, when Paul wrote to this church who had these spiritual gifts, this is what he said about some, not all in the church, but some. He says, there are contentions among you. And some of that contention was they prioritize God's gifted men. I'm Peter, I'm Apollos, I'm Cephas, and some even try to be spiritual and say, I'm of Christ. And so there was contention about which person. Well, that's contrary to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit sent each person and he didn't want the church to prioritize whose camp and to whose man they belong. That would be an indication that having spiritual people around you, the apostles, and having spiritual gifts among you, the things that he mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, is not an indicator that there was spirituality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 7, he says, My brethren and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal. Hmm. Even as unto babes in Christ, doesn't mean that they weren't saved. He just says that you're not living um, a mature life. You're living like a baby. He said, I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able to bear it, for you're yet carnal. Whereas there is among you, listen to what was going on in this church that had spiritual gifts and gifted people. He says, there is among you envying and strife, and divisions, and are you not carnal? 
and walk as men. So they were having difficulties even though they had these spiritual gifts. This is not a knock on the spiritual gifts. It is to say spiritual gifts does not always equate to spirituality. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 3, the Bible said, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now he's talking to the same church, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, he's not accusing them of the sin of fornication. One person did that. But what he is challenging them with is how comfortable this church had become that this sin was acceptable and okay in the eyes of God. So what this church had with all of their spiritual gifts is they showed an improper response to moral issues that was invading the church. And they were failing uh, to address the moral issues that would ultimately, could ultimately lead to the whole church becoming uh, affected. A little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. So they had spiritual gifts, but again, something else had crept in. He's not through. In 1 Corinthians 6, 6, he says, but brother go up to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now there is utterly a fault among you. Spiritual gifts, but they got some other things going on. Some this, some had this going on, some had lawsuits. He says that's a fault. Uh, and so he tells them this is wrong. Again, spiritual gifts do not equate to spirituality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said this concerning the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one of you take it before other his own supper, meaning they were taking their own food, throwing a feast, and calling at the Lord's Supper. And he says, you're messing up the picture of what the, whole, the Lord's Supper is all about. They even went so low that this is what the writer says in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, one is hungry and another is drunkard. So he's letting them know that there are some things going on here that you need to address if you're going to be spiritual, but having spiritual gifts is not the same as spirituality. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, and we're going to get to this chapter 14, but I wanted to jump a little bit ahead because he says, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you have a psalm, have a doctrine, have a tongue, have a revelation, have an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying, and what they were doing was each person was sort of bumping each other about who's going to do what next, when next, who had the most important thing to do, whose psalm was the best psalm, whose tongue should be heard now. So they're jostling and showing themselves uh, to be immature. And again, this, this, this is the bottom line I keep getting to. Spiritual gifts is not the same as spirituality because there was an immature behavior going on in the church and that immature behavior is why Paul writes this passage because it was leading to something that shouldn't have existed in the body of Christ which is a disunity and this is where he comes to address this subject. Now he begins with chapter 13 and verse 14 he says for the, the body is not one member but many. And so he says there is diversity yes he acknowledges that there is diversity but he also acknowledges that there is unity, that within the body there is unity. While each member is different, but each person is placed in the body and equipped to function in unity with the whole. And this is the groundwork. One body, many members. So now he's about to lay the groundwork of how he's going to take the human body to address the dysfunction that was happening in the spiritual body and that was taking place in Corinth in many areas that I've also mentioned. Many places where they were off base. They're still the body of Christ, but they're not operating like a body of Christ should. And so he begins by talking in verse, uh, beginning with verses 15, by showing that there's unity, the verse 16 and diversity. Foot, because I'm not the hand, I'm not the body, is it therefore not of the body? The ear, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Diversity, foot, ear, hand, all of those things are distinct. Hand, ear, foot, you just have to imagine. He said these are distinct parts, 
but they're not detached. You know, my hand should not be detached from my body. It serves no purpose. There are a lot of people who think I don't need the body of Christ. I can do my own thing out here. But God never intended the parts that he has made and the parts that he is gifted to operate outside of connection, attachment to a body. And so uh, the, for any part, the ear, the hand, the foot, uh, any part of your body to try to detach itself is crazy because the unity is found in diversity and diversity is found in unity. Two ears, two hands, two feet, but all of it attached because although different, they come together to make up a very essential part of the one body. There's diversity that is needed. Notice verse 17. He said, what if the whole body was an eye? You can use your imagination. Or were a hearing, one ear. So just imagine if one part says, I'm the preeminent part of all of this and we don't need nothing else. Eye says to the ear, I don't need you. Ear to the eye, I don't need you. Hand to the foot, I don't need you. No, every part of the body that God has given is needed. Not only in the material sense, but in the spiritual sense as well. Diversity is not only uh, uh, noted, but diversity is necessary and also diversity is very normal. Look at verses 18 through 20. He says, but now God has set the members, every one of the body as it pleased him. God has said, this is the normal process. He says also through verse 20, now they are many, now are they many members, but yet one body. This thing is of God. We didn't shape ourselves. It was God who shaped our bodies. And in that shaping, God made us exactly like he wanted us to be. When you're talking about the spiritual bodies, there's no big I, no little you. There's no you're not necessary. There's no I'm more important. There is my gift is. There is no one person who's more important. God uses us different. But he places an importance on the whole, that the whole, not parts, but the, there are parts, but he places the importance on the whole. Um, and then notice, if you would, in verses um, 21, he says, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. There's no contention in the body. One body part said, get out. I can function without you. Nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you, as important as the head is. It cannot move unless it has feet to carry it where it needs to go. So you can't say that this part of the body is no longer needed. And then in verse 21, imagine if your head and your eye and hand, I'm sorry, imagine if your eye and hand got in a fight. <laughs> we normally can get hit in the eye by somebody and we might do it ourselves accidentally. But none of us ever really want to hit ourselves in the eye with our own hand. Because although our hand may do it, a whole person is going to feel the pain. We'll talk about that later. So there's, there's no contention, should not be in the body. And yet, in the church of Corinth, there was, you know, I'm this side, you're that side. There was lawsuits, courts. Uh, there was, I got my food and you don't have yours. And I've got something to drink and you don't. There was, I've got this spiritual gift and I need to speak because mine is more important than yours. Oh, yeah, this is where they were. It's raw church, but it was real. And unfortunately, it's still real today. And it can be if we do not allow these principles to guide us of how God makes the body distinct, but also puts the body in such a way that it operates uh, in a unit uh, as a whole and as one. And then notice verse 23. There's no contempt. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. Some parts of our body we don't put on, our dis on display. And, you know, we don't mind dressing up our face and doing our hair. But, boy, we cover our feet up with socks and shoes and everything else. And they may not be the prettiest part of our body. But although we, we, we might look at them and say, hey, we, we don't care about that part. That part is important. Try to walk without a small toe or try to walk without a big toe. You need it for balance. And so there's nothing that God has put in the body that you can say this was totally unnecessary. You know, the body is made up of all kind of personalities. And we might think, well, we didn't need this one. 
The only personality that you don't need in the body is the part that causes division. But every part of that body is needful. Just imagine trying to be in a band and there's only one piece, one person marching on the field. It might be the trumpet guy, but he needs every other part. Uh, just imagine uh, someone trying to dig the Panama Canal and they decide they're going to dig it, but they have one person who's got one pick and shovel all by himself. Just imagine if a soldier went to war, but it's only one soldier. In other words, you can't function by yourself. You, you're going to need people, and people are going to need you. Uh, that's the purpose of life. There are some people who feel like, hey, Christian life, I need to be a hermit, get away from everybody, don't want to be around people. That is not the way God intended it. And I'm glad when Jesus came into the world, he got around people. And what he's told us to do is to go into, not isolate. He told us to go into the world. And so as we go into the world, we've got to understand that as God brings people from the world by saving them into the church, he has brought them in and they have, we have something to contribute. They have something to contribute that we have something that each of us need. He says in verse 23, he says, and upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant honor. Meaning we pay attention to things that we don't think that are essential that we need. Now there's an exterior side of us that says, boy, my face, um, my hands, things that we look at and say, boy, these are the best parts. We really need this. You have some internal organs that cannot be seen. You have liver, kidneys, and hearts, and lungs. And believe it or not, you can do without an arm. You don't want to do without a, a liver. You see, that which cannot be seen is sometimes the most important part of your body. And so when people who are public and want to be public all the time, they think this is the best way. But sometimes it's the unseen that create the greater need or do the greatest good for the body because it just functions where it is or that person does where they're supposed to function. And so there's not to be a dividing between what's indispensable or what's dispensable. Uh, it's not to be a part of where I am more visible, you're less visible. Even the less, as I say, the less visible is sometimes critical and very important uh, to the church. And so he begins, he's continuing this teaching about the body. He says in verse 24, for our comely parts have no need. Maybe there's something you say, I don't, I don't need to address, but it doesn't mean that you ignore the other part. He says, but God have tempered. It, God took everything in the body and he brought it or blended it or mixed it together. He mixed what you think is comely with the uncomely. He, he might have put a nice looking hand with a rough looking foot but he tempered the body so that there would be no lack. He knew that every part of us was necessary. The writer again says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, one thing that it will produce is this. When he mixes it and God brings something together, there should be no schisms, he calls it in verse 25, or divisions. The word schism is that we were not formed in a human or spiritual body to be contentious or competing one with another. No rivalry, no jealousy, no confusion. Just imagine if your hand says, I want to reach over here, and your foot says, but I don't want to go that way. I remember the old cartoon with little dogs, uh, the little dog and Charlie Brown. He would be laying there, and then his stomach would say, I'm hungry. And feet would say, but I'm tired. And every other part of the body would complain. But the stomach said, we're going to go eat. And he would always give way because he said, wherever the stomach goes, that's where the feet go. But just imagine if you had this ongoing battle with different parts of your body saying, I do, I don't, I will, I'm better. He said, just imagine, you don't want that kind of schism. Your right hand shouldn't get jealous of your left. Your eye should not be jealous of your ear. He said it would just be crazy. There should be no schism. But here's what we should have. He says that members should have the same care one for another. There should be concern. And he says why. He said whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. We should have care. If you hit your finger with a hammer 
and it's only just your finger you hit, trust me, the rest of your body is going to be aware that you hit your finger. Sometimes when you thump your toe or your foot at night, you hit it hard and then the rest of your body said, here it comes, get ready. Because although it was your toe, you feel it everywhere. Same thing is true with, with the spiritual body. When one suffer, all suffer. We, 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 we hurt when somebody hurts. And by the way, that verse is very applicable that says when one suffer, meaning suffering is part, maybe part of the journey for a person. And it's not the idea that when you become a Christian, that it's not supported here that you won't suffer. He says, if one member suffers, whatever they're suffering. And sometimes the church members are suffering, uh, whether it's bereavement or sickness and whatever. Uh, and it's incumbent on the other members to minister to that part that is suffering. Um, you know, you, you tell people, hey, I know where you are, I know what you're going through, you comfort one another. That's what we do when a person's suffering. We don't just say, eh, handle it all by yourself, you're on your own. The reason being is there might be a day that we have some suffering and it is good to have others who come along and help you to bear that load and to comfort you in that suffering. So he says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer. And if one member be honored, there should be no jealousy. Uh, all the members rejoice. In other words, uh, when I eat something good at the table, my foot goes to patty. And my foot is not doing no chewing, it's not doing no swallowing, it's not digesting anything, it's not the stomach. But my foot is under that table just as happy as it could be because the rest of my body is going to enjoy that dessert. Ice cream, pie, and you know, you, you know what it means to pat your foot under the table. But that means it's good to the whole body. So when something good happens to the one part of the body, everybody ought to rejoice. If a person gets a raise and uh, they're doing well and they move up the ladder, there should be nothing in us that says, oh, they think they something. No, we should rejoice. We should be glad. When some person has a church that is growing and people are being added, there's nothing in you that should say, man, that shouldn't happen to them. It should have been me. The reason we should rejoice is that's just God at work in that body. The same thing is true in the spiritual body, the local body that you're in. There are going to be people who are losing a job and, and needing help and other people who are getting raises. And we have to learn how to balance that care and the concern that we show uh, with one another. And then he concludes it. He says in verse 27, he started in verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. And then verse 27, he concludes by saying, I've been talking about a physical body. I've been using that illustration, but he says to the Corinthian saints, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. But because you're the body of Christ and I'm part of that body, my function here and how I conduct myself in the body is important. God is not going to be pleased with me if I am, am wrong in how I function in the body. Now, I know my role as a spiritual leader, and we're going to talk about that later, that he diversifies some and give them certain things to do. But in the body, we function as a unit in a whole. It's no big I, no little you. There's no such thing as we need this one and we don't need that one. That's not how this works. So now he is, he's working us through how those who are diversified, different personalities, different in their gifts, different in their abilities, they ought to function. But later on, we're going to see some of them were jostling each other for position. They were pushing each other's gifts as being the greatest gifts. And this is out of order. In the choir, there's no such thing as that's my song. If someone else sings it and they sing it well, can you say amen to the glory of God? If you do something and you want to be seen, uh, then that's your reward. Uh, if you give something to be seen, that's your reward. But if you do something to bless someone because that's a part of the body and you don't let your right hand analogy, just do it, do it in silence. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. He's not saying that there's a disconnect. He is saying treat it in such a way that it becomes something you've done in secret from your heart to help the body. Now, he is really pushing you and me 
that no matter what our spiritual gifts are, uh, I have been in churches that have been divided over some of the craziest things. They've been divided on what color the carpet was going to be, where the piano was going to sit, what color the robes were going to be, how we're going to march in, just crazy stuff. God would look, I'm sure he looks at this and the Holy Spirit shakes his head at the confusion that we have. Now, can we have serious disagreements? Yes. But do we have things that guide us through that? Yes. We can sit down, we can communicate, we can come to the understanding of what God's word does say about something and then commit ourselves to follow this. Over 38 years of ministry, uh, I, I have tried to, and I hope it'll continue, to feel like I didn't have to be right as the pastor. Not, I didn't have to be right in the eyes of people. I did have to be right with God. And I think if that's the attitude we have that we're right with God, we can live with that. So it doesn't mean that I have to always be right. There's even spiritual leaders. We sometimes need to be checked. And I have been, and I have appreciated because they did it out of a heart of love. But that's because we belong to a body, and the body, every part of it, we need each other. And so Paul is trying to take us through now, looking at our diversities, even with our diverse gifts, of how they should function in the body, and they should not be something that's in disunity, because that does not honor the Lord, and it can lead to nothing but confusion. In our chapters to come, beginning with 13, the end, I'm sorry, chapter 12, uh, we're going to finish next week at the willing. So go on and do some study on verses 28 through verses 31, because we're going to spend time there as he now jumps to chapter 13 and tries to give us some even more guidance on spiritual matters. But he did not want us to miss the fact that we might be diverse in our gifts, our abilities, different parts, but we're to form one unit with no jealousies, no animosities, no infighting. Also, if one suffer, we suffer. One rejoice, we rejoice. That's what he's told us we need to do. I don't think that's hard. I just think it's the way it needs to be done. Anything other than that, probably we don't need to be around it. Remember, God is not the author of confusion. All right, we'll get you out of here this evening. We pray that you'll study these verses Go through them as we've tried to talk about them, as particularly as we're trying to educate ourselves in the context of spiritual gifts and spiritual gifted people. Lord, bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you be blessed. We'll yell at you again.